so uh, and the recording has just started so if, if please do keep your cameras off if you can uh, for the panel to be on everyone's screens um, but hi and thanks for joining us this afternoon for this very special online panel in on anti-racism and sexual and reproductive health my name is Jamal Hakim I'm the managing director of MSI Australia for another week anyway this will be my last official forum and I wanted to do something that is really close to my heart and some work that I've been doing around anti-racism so really thank you to everyone on the panel for joining me today I'd like to first start by acknowledging that we are meeting on unceded land I'm joining you from the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people and I'd like to pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are joining us today in Woiwurrung language Womanjika uh, that means come with purpose. And I think we're here on a particular purpose this afternoon to talk about anti-racism, uh, which is something that is really, really important for all of us. I'd also like to acknowledge the amazing panel that is joining me today and the work that you all do, it's such amazing work. I'm so, uh, feel so privileged to have you here. Cherise Bazakot, Head of Health and Wellbeing at Children's Ground. Nisha Kot, Clinical Director of Obzingani at Peninsula Health. BJ Roach, Chair of the Council of Presidents uh, of Medical Colleges in Ranskog, Rossi Ariel Lees, Acting Team Leader, Research, Advocacy and Policy at the Multicultural Centre for Women's Health, and the amazing Isabel Odeberberg, journalist and author of the recently released Hard to Bear Investigating the Science and Silence of Miscarriage that was just launched last night. Congratulations, Izzy. Welcome, everybody. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize all the giants who have worked in the anti-racism space whose shoulders we stand on and are able to progress equity as a result of all their work. We can't be here today without so many people standing up for the rights of our diverse communities, something that's really important. I do also want to recognize that we can't have these conversations in isolation. We also need to acknowledge that bias and discrimination across so many areas, including gender and sexuality, is interrelated and it's more pronounced against people of color. The presence of neo-Nazis at the 18th of March transphobic gathering at the steps of state parliament in Victoria is the most recent example of that. And I'm heartened by the strong community support for our trans and gender diverse communities. I wanted to start by saying that hate speech and discrimination in all its forms is not on. Hate has no place in our community and we must all stand together against bigotry racism and discrimination in all its forms. So today, we are exploring anti-racism in sexual and reproductive health. And hopefully we'll leave you with some practices that will support your practice in increasing cultural safety spaces for both clients, community and staff alike. Now, on to our panel, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and answer our first question. What is anti-racism to you and how does it impact day-to-day -day life? Therese, I'm going to start with you. Um, thanks, Jamal, and thanks for having me on the panel. Um, it's a real honour to be here um, and very esteemed speakers alongside me. Um, my name's Cherise. I'm an Arunda woman. I'm from Alice Springs or in Bondwa in Central Australia. Um, I'm a midwife. That's my background. I've been a midwife for about 10 years. Um, I'm an advocate, um, mostly speaking on, um, you know, First Nations midwifery, um, trying to build the workforce, but also um, talking about birthing on country, um, quite vocal in um, pregnancy loss and miscarriage, having experienced that myself. And I sit on Red Nose um, National Scientific Advisory Group. Um, I'm also the chair of a scholarship board and we give scholarships to First Nations midwives. Um, and amongst all of that, I'm a mum. So, and I'm a mum of um, four children, um, uh, one daughter who I lost and then um, miscarriage as well. Um, so just unpacking anti-racism, like I had a bit of a think about it this morning and I really thought, um, you know, working, working in this space and being someone who is a woman that's, you know, being Indigenous, it's quite challenging. And so it's a really tough job and most um, of the panel would know that it's a really tough job to try and dismantle those systems that are impacting my people constantly and the things that I see as a midwife, um, the things that I've experienced myself and then being in the system and working there and having to engage in that structure that is not built for me. It's not a system that I've been a part of designing. Um, so it's quite challenging in, in trying to, um, I guess, trying to get some of that exclusion and discrimination and trying to draw that out of the services that are meant to be put into place to, um, to help and assist people um, because we've never been a part of establishing any of, of those systems. So 
Yeah, it's a tough job with anti-racism and it's everyone's job and we all have to be responsible in trying to navigate and get rid of that. It's, it can't just be that Indigenous person or that person of colour's responsibility for them to, um, you know, form that anti-racism action and we're going to get in there and we're going to get rid of it. It has to be everyone's job. So, um, yeah, just um, recommend, like, commendations to everybody who's able to, to sit on this panel and speak about it and, and knowing that you know at some point in throughout our career or even as a person we've all you we've all been discriminated against or, or had racist um, attitudes towards us and so I think that's what drives me that's definitely something that pushes me. 100% I think that's a really terrific way of putting it Therese it's everyone's job and I love that it is every single person's role we're all leaders we all have a role to play whether we're bystanders whatever it may be. So I love that. Thank you. Nisha, can I throw it to you next? Yes, thank you. Thanks very much for having me. I'm Dr. Nisha Kot. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. I'm based in Melbourne. I sit on the board of Ranskog as well as the Rural Doctors Association of Victoria and the Migrant Women's Association as well. For me, it is not enough to just be not a racist. And if I or any of us catch anyone saying, or catch ourselves saying I'm not a racist, but I'm coming from, I think it's really important, as Sheree said, that we make sure that we make it everybody's business. It's not just an individual. And the thing with privilege is that when we have it, we don't re recognize it. We don't realize that we have that privilege. It's only someone who doesn't have the privilege, who knows its absence. So it's important that we shut up and listen to the people who are telling us what they haven't got. 100%, I love that. Uh, thank you very much, Nisha. And it's so true, isn't it? It's Often, I think it's a really important thing to acknowledge that we all are a little bit racist. It's inherent bias that we've had to grow up with as a society. So catching that is, we shouldn't be putting it to shame. Actually, we need to recognize it and to take, take action. And that's a really simple way of doing it. If you say, I'm not racist, but catch yourself and know, actually, I need to take action. Uh, thank you very much. Love that. Uh, BJ, can I throw it to you next? Thanks, Jamal. Um, I'm sitting on unceded land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I think that that's an important place to start, because I think if we're going to talk about anti-racism anti in our country, <clears throat> then that is, uh, that is where it sits in its strongest form. And it has become something that has been institutionalized. It's become something that's normalized. And so when I thought about how to answer this question, I actually want to do something that is slightly counterintuitive, which is to say, I don't want to talk about the problem. Because the problem we're talking about the problem is that we normalize the problem. That just becomes the way it is. Aboriginals have lower life expectancy. Um, racism's inherent in our society. That's the way that it is, and now we've got a problem to solve. So I want to turn it around a little bit and say anti-racism or whatever that expression means, but it's, it's an opportunity. And actually, that's what I'm interested in. That's what I desperately want. I want the opportunity to walk alongside Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, to learn, to listen, to feel that my Australia incorporates all of those people. Um, well, not incorporates, but that I belong in a country that, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have lived in for, for 40,000 years. And I want to extend that then to think about the 50% of us who, who came from a country, another country, and say, why don't you want to learn about those humans, learn about where they came from, um, mix with them, eat their food, listen to their songs and their stories. And so I think anti-racism presents us with this extraordinary opportunity to expand our world. And then we don't look at it through a deficit model. We look at it through um, an extraordinary opportunity, as an extraordinary opportunity. Thanks, Vijay. I love that. And it's so important to be positive around this, isn't it? It's not about uh, always taking that negative lens. And I think that's something we've all learned in this space. I completely agree with you. And so that's such a beautiful way to put it. Um, I would say to, you know, I've had the privilege, particularly through council, to spend so much time with elders um, for the work that I do from a cultural perspective in council. And 
you really get to uh, celebrate such a beautiful culture. We have a culture of First Nations people that's over 60,000 years, as you said, with so much knowledge, so much art, so much to learn from as well. And I think we all need to spend time to do that. And, and I've had the privilege over the last few years to do even more of that. And I would really urge everyone, as you've said, to do that. Um, I'll plug in maybe the uh, Yurumboy Festival is on from the 4th to the 14th of May. Uh, in the city of Melbourne. It is one of the biggest uh, uh, metro celebrations of First Nations culture across the country. It's delivered, produced by First Nations people. So one of the ways you, everyone can do that. Thanks, Vijay. Rossi, I'm gonna jump to you uh, as well. Thanks so much, Jamal. Um, so I am Rosie. I'm the research advocacy and policy team leader at the Multicultural Centre for Women's Health. Um, I am streaming in from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Um, and like Vijay, I, th I think anti-racism starts from there. So they're all on stolen land, um, except um, Ab Aboriginal people. So acknowledging that um, and taking the lead of Ab Aboriginal people, because they are the leaders in anti-racism in Australia, because they've borne the brunt of it. Um, and so I think as well, and anti-racism is about recognising that racial privilege and disadvantage have been historically institutionalised through colonisation, um, through very crucially re reproductive and family planning policy um, and migration control. So which includes policies that restrict the access of, um, you know, temporary a working visa and student visa holders to sexual and re reproductive health services. So it is really kind of um, very much a part of the system that 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 we're in, and it shapes our ability to seek and receive health care um, on an equal footing. Um, so I think, you know, in that kind of context, anti-racism really looks like advocating for universal health care access, regardless of visa status. I think for um, at, at Multicultural Centre for Women's Health, that's a really important one. Um, and kind of reflecting on what everyone's saying, because SRH sits so much at the intersections, I mean, with this kind of history of, you know, um, control and coercion that, that can happen through family planning policy and the, um, you know, like, so sitting at those intersections of racism and um, eugenics and ableism and heteronormativity um like so it kind of sits at the intersections of all the problems that vj like you were saying it means that it also sits at the intersections of where we can do some really emancipatory work um and i think that's really exciting thank you and I, that's a really important point uh rosia about um making sure we're supporting residents in australia too regardless of visa status and i think we've seen that uh, play out in sexual reproductive health. Um, we know where there's a commitment from the ACT around supporting um, uh, people who are living in the ACT regardless of their status as well. And we want to see that across uh, all of healthcare, which is really important. Thank you. Last but not least on this question and for introduction, Izzy, and please do also let us know about your new book. I'm really excited mm -hmm. to read it soon. Thank you. So my book is um, Hard to Bear, um, Investigating the Science and Silence of Miscarriage. Um, Sharice, um, to my great delight, agreed to lead author the chapter on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander experience called Gagil Marang, which is uh, Gatang for getting well. Um, and did the most phenomenal job. And she is a friggin' powerhouse of a person and an advocate and a warrior. She's amazing. Um, in terms, like, so uh, being the, um, what I believe to be the only person not of colour on the panel, I'm going to take a slightly different um, approach and say that I really, through, through researching the book, um, I would say that for me, anti-racism is about doing your homework and doing the reading and doing the listening. So for me, that looked like reading a lot of um, research and information and texts and philosophies from a, 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 a sort of a vast array of um, diverse people, um, diverse in you know, colour, diverse in gender, diverse in sexuality, like uh, the, the gamut of, of people who are marginalised in our community. I should add, sorry, I did get very excited when you said to mention the book and I am coming to you from Yalakut Willem, unceded Yalakut Willem country. Um, so I, you know, and for me, like one of the most interesting things that I 
read um, was the Ramsden um, description of cultural safety. And one of my moments, you know, my sort of, oh my gosh, how did I not understand this before moments is that, um, you know, the cultural safety in a healthcare environment cannot be defined by the healthcare provider. Cultural safety can only be defined by the person seeking care. So only the person, the patient or the person seeking care, however you want to describe it, who is actually seeking care can say that they feel culturally safe. And having worked in some medical environments and having written on this topic, I can categorically say that that does often not happen. Often you have providers saying that they provide a culturally safe space, but not actually asking the recipients of their care whether they feel culturally safe. And I think that's really not fair. And I think it's sort of like false advertising, a fundamental misunderstanding of what cultural safety is. And it actually makes me quite angry because I think it's lazy and laziness is just not acceptable in this space. So for me as a white person, and I am diverse in some senses, um, but ultimately I have the privilege of not being a person of colour and can, can pass in many ways and access that privilege. Um, you know, I think it's about listening and learning and understanding the damage that you can do, whether intentionally or not intentionally as a person of privilege in this space. Thank you. Thanks, Izzy. This is such an important point. And we often in health spaces are trying to tick the boxes around accreditation, about credentialing, about all the regulation that we need to meet. But in reality, uh, it's not a tick box exercise. Uh, and I think that's um, it's so important for us to continue to remember. It's defined by the person who's seeking care. I love that. Uh, if anything, take that away. I'd love to, I think, want to pivot with that around a conversation around uh, traditional health knowledge and practices. And I'm, I'm going to start with you in a moment, Cherise, and also interested in hearing from Nisha. And perhaps um, we can also touch on that cultural safety definition that Izzy spoke about, because I think that's a really important conversation. Cherise. Yeah, thanks, Jamal. Um, you know, like the way that we, the way that I work is through, you know, just my everyday decision making is all done through family. So I talking to my community, talking to my elders, talking to my sisters, my mothers, my aunties, finding out exactly what their needs are. And I think that's a big part of the discussion that's missing is that we're not actually going out to community and talking to people about what they want. Sir. We're constantly bringing stuff in. We're constantly bringing um, information and services. And this is working really great for Indigenous people in, you know, on, over in the US. And this is working great for Maori people. But it's also like, you know, what works well for us is stuff that we know. It's cultural knowledge that's embedded. It's in our minds. It's something that we've grown. Even up, you know, even in utero, a baby in utero already has a responsibility. It has a kin kinship connection to country. So, you know, there's the importance of actually finding out what exactly our needs are. And I think a big thing around, you know, embedding that cultural knowledge is that you know, we, we look at people in a holistic way as a midwife, but also as an Aboriginal person, I look at someone and I look at that, you know, I look at their spirit and I look at their, you know, their social and emotional well-being. And I want to make sure that other than the physical health, I want to make sure that their spiritual health is right. Um, and a big part of the work I'm doing at Children's Ground is we're actually mapping, doing some cultural mapping around the traditional practices for pregnancy and birthing and postnatal in that postnatal period with baby. Like what are the important different steps that mothers and babies have to have through that journey because we know the blood tests and the ultrasounds and we've got all that western mapping that's done and we know exactly what women need but it's also bringing through that importance of cultural knowledge and valuing first nations language and bringing that forward and saying look you can have that but you can also have this if you want to feel if you're feeling disconnected or you want to feel culturally strong then why can't you also have those strengths in culture? And just touching on what Vijay said about, um, you know, working off from that strength based and a lot of the work that I do with Children's Ground, um, and it's also something that I've taken on myself as an Aboriginal person, is like talking about my community from a strength based model, instead of saying like, oh, you know, as soon as we're pregnant, we're high risk. We've got all these chronic illnesses and you know you're impacted by this and you're more likely to die and your baby's more likely to die well actually talking about what are the strengths of my community and and some of the things is that culture and language and bringing that forward um, the work that I've been doing on birthing on country and I worked on a national program that's now you know one of the places we've been working with is the uh, beautiful women down in um, in Nara at Waminda that got funding to build this birthing on country service which is you know birthing on country is is a big conversation but it but it is that 
whole of sort of life from, you know, before women are pregnant right through to grandmothers. And it, it's how we value that whole life length of that woman or that person. And with the Birthing on Country service, that was led by the women. That was something we went out and consulted with women and they actually came to us and said, this is what we want for our service. This is what we want for our birthing. We want this for our sexual and reproductive health. And that's what's being implemented. And that's that's where it all starts is actually getting out there and actually finding out what what it is that we want because those systems that are being designed by the majority groups um, rather than those minority groups, they're just not, they just don't work. They don't have the right outcomes. We're not being listened to, you know, I want to value, I want to put value on knowledge spaces being supported, but also individual agency. So, you know, what's good for the community is not necessarily good for that one individual person as well. Um, and just to, to highlight that I've worked in remote communities, I've seen, um, I've worked in rural hospitals, I've seen women constantly being refused um, opportunities to have their implant on taken out because, you know, you can't have a baby because you're too sick. Why are we deciding and determining if this woman can have a baby? You know, she's got a new partner and we're saying, oh, you, mu you, you must wait two or three years until your youngest child gets a bit older so then you can have a baby. And, and women aren't leaving the hospital without having some form of contraception and having that six week checkup. It's because we're afraid that women, will, women that are sick will get pregnant. Well, why aren't we dealing with women's sickness, but also supporting women? And a lot of women that have infertility issues in, in community, but that, that's never highlighted because it's almost like, oh, well, why would we want to support Aboriginal women to have babies when they're so high risk? And now we've got a whole new generation of babies that are coming through that are born really unhealthy and really sick. And yeah, frankly, it's just re it's really frustrating. It's just trying to get some sort of recognition to say, this is what we want, but how can we be supported to have exactly what we want? And, you know, I'm someone who struggled with infertility and, and at times I did feel nervous about going to see the doctor because I was obese. And, you know, like what would the doctor say to me about, oh, well, your health is not good. So maybe you shouldn't try having a baby. So, you know, there's lots of different challenges, but I think in, in trying to set up a service that's, you know, having that culture embedded, that's the most important thing is going back to the community and actually taking the time to be with them. And we're not we're not pushing stuff through because we've got this time frame of, and so much money that we wanna spend. It's like actually taking the time. There's been 200 and something years of damage that's, that's been done. That's not gonna take overnight to resolve all of that. It's gonna take a long, long time to get to where we wanna be. Thank you, Therese. And it's such, such a powerful, some powerful words there. And I think ultimately recognizing women are resilient women are powerful first nations people are resilient they are powerful and and we need to also recognize that it comes down to bodily autonomy so beautifully said thank you so much and uh, nisha it's love to hear from you on this i i was just listening to sharees and thinking that in every culture across the world having a baby pregnancy childbirth or not having a baby are such important decisions that aren't just limited to just the individuals involved. They are usually a, a family decision or a community is also involved in it. And from my, my culture, I'm of Indian origin. And you know, from my culture, certainly there is a whole process involved around having a baby. There is a process involved around get, having a village around you when you have a baby. And I reflect on my own first pregnancy. My child was born in India and I was surrounded by aunties, grandma, and there was this whole support system so that when my baby cried, there was always an elderly person who said, look, it might be this, it might be that. Why don't we try this? Why don't we try that? So as a new mother, I felt supported. I didn't feel alone. And those are the sorts of traditional practices, which when we migrate, we lose. So I had a second child, not in India, and thought, oh, my God, this, this, I, I don't know what to do anymore. And so how do we support those sorts of things? And again, it comes down to something that Rossi raised earlier, visa issues. So if you are on a temporary student or alternative visa, can you support your parents to come and be with you when you have a child? Or indeed, if you have a miscarriage or if you have a decision where you are in a position where you have to undergo a procedure because, for example, your child is not likely to survive and you're going to be dealing with bereavement. These are all situations where we need family, we need our community, we need the village around us to make sure that we deal with that situation. Yes, medically, there'll be all of the A, B, C, D. These are the things we'll do. These are the drugs we'll give you and that's how we'll deal with it. But ultimately that ends at 
kind of the door of the hospital. And when you leave, you still have a lot of healing and recovery to do. And that needs village and community. And how do we support that? And that really, to me, is key of how we deal with this sort of, and it is racism when we say that, you know, people who come from elsewhere can't have these support systems because they've come from elsewhere. That is a form of racism and we should be advocating for an end to that. 100%. Thank you, Nisha. That is uh, beautifully said. And those traditional practices are so important on that. I think I've been thinking about that and having a child in a non-traditional way uh, myself in, in you know the next few years. And, and really that comment of it takes a village to raise a child. Um, I, uh, Esther Perel uh, talks about the move that we've had uh, as, a, as a global community from a village to a city. Um, but I do, th and I think that's had an impact on everything we do. And, and this is part of some of those issues societally. But I do think the, the last few years especially have shown that we do need a middle ground. We do need to think about how we have that village paradigm in everyday practice in our everyday community, regardless of whether you're in a high rise or whether you're out in uh, a rural or regional community. Uh, and they're really important for our needs. Does anyone want to add anything to this conversation before we move on to the next question? I just want to open up the question, Vijay. I just wanted to say that the other risk I think is that you can, is making <clears throat> things that the non-dominant culture does um, exotic. And I think that actually having living, and, and I don't know enough, so I apologize for my ignorance, but the, the way that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders live compared to the way that the dominant culture lives is not something interesting, it's normal. That's the way that, that people live. And in fact, it's a bit odd that we built a city and roads and all that sort of stuff. That's the strange activity. The way that Nisha described having a baby in India is actually probably more in common with most people on the planet than the slightly weird white Anglo-Saxon, you have your baby, you go home, you don't talk to anybody, you do it all in isolation and you therefore, you know, experience it without your aunties and your uncles and your extended family. So I think that it's we need to sort of reclaim it and actually say, no, in Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their, their way of doing things is the norm. And then all these other things are adjustments to that. And just to follow on from what Vijay is saying, it's all of that, you know, like we're doing some work in my community now about the use of our words and trying to empower, like using Aranda words in, in place of, of English words, because we want to put value on the work that we're doing that, you know, this is practices that happened many, many years before we were westernised and medicalised. But, you know, use of terminology like ancient and dreaming and traditional and words like that, it's like, no, this is actual everyday practice for our people in the community. Like we have Nankari, we have traditional healers who are called upon daily to go and lay hands on people and provide that spiritual healing. And this is not something that's ancient or traditional. This is like modern. This is for us. This is happening like right now. 100%. Uh, Izzy, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to. There we go. Um, I just wanted to add um, to what Sharice was saying about, you know, things like um, Implanon and, and that. And I think in this country, we have traditionally seen reproductive justice purely um, in the context of abortion and contraception. And it is far more broad um, in the American definition by, you know, civil rights activists like Loretta Ross, um, far more broad. It's also about access to sexual health screening. It's about, um, you know, um, the decision to have a child. The fact that people on low incomes are not given access to artificial reproductive technologies um, or, th you know, those sorts of things. So, you know, re true reproductive justice is about both deciding when you do not want to have a child, deciding when you do want to have a child, and also in the meantime, being given all of the health options that you need in order to make either of those decisions and make them in a healthy way. And so I guess I just wanted to add that, um, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in particular have had a history in this stolen country of, you know, um, of coercion in reproductive rights, in, in you know, forced 
um, forced um, sterilization and things like that. Um, and we have to acknowledge that um, they need to be empowered um, to be healthy in whatever way they choose. Um, certainly the idea, what Sharice was saying about um, controlling people's reproduction, reproductive choices makes me feel physically ill when I hear those stories and I hear them a lot, but it still never ceases to make me feel um, sick. Um, and the other thing I, I, I would say is that, you know, in terms of sexual health, I look specifically at the space um, of miscarriage and like we can safely assume that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are experiencing much higher rates of miscarriage because um, they don't have access to a lot of the sexual health um, you know services that um, other communities do so for instance if they had high rates of chlamydia higher rates of chlamydia which they do they are more likely to have things like fallopian tube scarring which can lead to ectopic pregnancy and that equally goes for other um, diverse communities that don't have access to care, whether that is because they feel unsafe in accessing that care, such as gender diverse people, whether they have a disability, whether they have English is not their first language and therefore are intimidated or unable to effectively get the care that they need. Um, and I don't think we can possibly make that statement without acknowledging intersectionality in the way of multiple layers of disadvantage and how they converge to create a totally, totally different experience of medical care than what I, for instance, um, would experience. Thank you, Izzy. Such important points, I think, and that intersectionality is definitely something we all have to always consider and think about because you're right there's so much that goes into every single person's decision their circumstances and um that is something they only know as well so again how do you create culturally safe and foster culturally safe spaces it, it, it needs to realize that and understand that so I'm going to jump into another quick question before we get to our last question. I'm going to try and get some comments on this one before I ask everybody the last question, which is uh, I want to get to and spend some time on with uh, actions. But just coming to strategies around fostering cultural safety within SRH in particular, sexual and reproductive health care services. I'm going to start with you, VJ, and I'm keen to hear from uh, Rossi and Izzy as well on this one and everyone else in the panel. VJ. Can you just rephrase that question for me, Jamal? Yeah, of course. So what are the most effective strategies for fostering cultural safety within SRH? I think we've been talking a lot about the importance of it. Um, really keen to hear from you on, you know, what are some of those strategies that you think we can use to create that environment? So I thought about this a lot and I thought that we could spend, you know, where we do a whole workshop on all the sort of different things that we should do and we should have this committee and we can talk about it forever. But so therefore, this is a sort of higher level observation, which is that I think we need to go beyond discussing the health system and healthcare and the minutiae of all of that as isolated issues. I think every time we have the conversation, we've got to integrate the fact that that human is, and, and the system involves family, it involves education, it involves employment, it involves recreation, it involves all the other things that then contribute to health. Because otherwise we just say, okay, this group of people have a higher rate of diabetes and so therefore we're going to tackle that. But how can you tackle that if you don't look at their economic situation and the fact that it's cheaper to buy food that has a high GI index or you know, but that whatever example you want to use. So but then that becomes too hard because then that says, well, you're trying to change the whole culture. Well, yes, that's why we're doing this meeting. We're not trying to tinker at the edges. We're sick of tinkering at the edges and patting ourselves on the back because we came up with a new strategy or a new program. And we need to look at the human in the context of their whole psychosocial well-being, their family of origin, the culture they come from, all the things that make them who they are rather than just looking at the tiny little aspect of them that we like and that we can measure and that we can try to treat. And the last thing I wanted to say was it then requires a language that needs to change. And there's two parts to that. One is, and this panel's got it, we have to have the guts to say the word racism. We have to have the courage to call this out. We need to hear those voices and not say, I'm sorry, could you just please be a polite brown person because we don't like angry brown people? We, you know, and could you just put your point of view gently because we don't want to offend other people? 
And so we've got to, we have to change that and we have to be strong enough to do that. And then on the other hand, particularly those of us providing that care, but everyone who's involved in the space, we need a language of respect. We need a language of kindness. We need to just be warm and generous to one another. And that's not having a group hug. It's just actually what makes the world a better place and will allow us then to move on. And there requires also, particularly from those of us with privilege and power, is some humility. Thank you, VJ. That's beautifully said. I love that. We do have to be strong in that language of respect and recognising that we need to allow people to speak and have that conversation and not to shame them, isn't it? So we can have that discussion so that people can learn and, and accept that people, uh, as we said, I think earlier, that we're all racist in some ways. They're inherent biases. We've got to recognise it and actually then step up all those people. But I love what you said there is let's be warm and generous. We are all people ultimately. So thank you. Rosie, can I jump to you on this question? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Jamal. Um, yes, yeah, so I just um, would echo what, what Vijay just said, um, that culturally, like um, foster, strategies to foster cultural safety are really about strategies to foster, like to, to be actively anti-racist in, in your organisation and your practice. Um, so it's really about, and when we take, like, like is, is, Isabel was saying, when we take an intersectional approach to, to anti-racism, it's really about working towards transforming systems and, um, you know, systemic institutions and, and our societies and culture. Um, you know, so I just want to give an example from the Multicultural Centre for Women's Health of historically and, and currently how, how we do this. Um, so we started as an organisation... <laughs> Um, back in the 1970s, uh, where we, um, there was a group of researchers in Melbourne who did some research on rates of abortion, and they found that migrant women were having much higher rates of abortion um, than Australian-born women. And the reason for that was that they didn't have access to information about contraception. Um, and so there was kind of a movement then, like um, the community health movement, the feminist movement, the um, my migrant um, movement and, and the labour movement, they were like, you know, working in, in, in sol solidarity to come up with a solution. Um, and that solution was taking in teams of bilingual health workers into the factories where women worked and providing them with information about their options um, in language during their breaks, because that was like you know this kind of community health ethos of taking health out of the clinic into the communities um and and what we found then and what we've always found is that when you um treat people with with respect and you tell them about their options people are hungry for knowledge you know um and and we know this now like with in in international students for for instance and being um restricted from from accessing sexual and re re reproductive health services they are they are really hungry for um information and access to those services so I think um cultural safety really you know looks like not assuming anything um and providing that information in a way because once you provide that inf information in a way that people can access it and and you are actively respecting them um I think that's where tra transformative change can can really occur. That's awesome. Thank you so much for those real life uh, as well examples. Uh, and it's really great to be seeing the way that you're doing it at MCWH. Mate. So I salute you for it. Izzy, um, what do you think? Um, as someone who, um, you know, there are, there are limited ways in which I've had to seek cultural um, sa culturally safe care. And as someone who isn't a sexual um, health services provider, um, I was thinking, you know, I'm not really appropriate to give an opinion on this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to reference a work that I think everyone could read um, that is really, really important. And it's called Yat Jewel again. It's a book that was edited by Odette Best and Brent Bromer Fredericks, both professors and both exceptional scholars. Um, and it is designed for a nursing or midwifery audience, but honestly, I've read it cover to cover and it's incredibly useful um, to understand as a white, if for any white, I'm speaking to, sorry, white practitioners um, out there um, or, um, you know, I think that, I think it's a really great way to look at yourself and say, 
what do I bring to care that is make that might potentially make people feel unsafe and these are some of these things that the things that you have control over and some of the things that you don't have control over but I think it's really important that it's called Yat Juligan sorry there's someone in the chat asking what it's called it's called Yat Juligan um, and I'll spell that for you um, it's Y-A-T-D-J-U-L-I-G-I-N I looked up the spelling for exa- exactly this reason um, now and and I think like you also as a as a white person I think we have to acknowledge that simply being in a space might make people uncomfortable, right? So an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person who has been subject to violence within um, the medical system, and I use violence in the broad sense, simply having a white person in the room, they may be uncomfortable. They may only want to be treated by, you know, um, people that they trust and that might not be you. And it's not a personal issue. It's just that's, you know, that's about what providing cultural safety is. So I'm going to stop now, but highly recommend it as a really good practical ways to 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 understand cultural safety and how you play into it thanks Izzy and we might put that we'll send that around as well or put it in the chat I think someone's just put it in the chat as well thank you that's terrific uh, and I'll go to Nisha and then I'm going to go to our final question to wrap us up Jamal I wanted to highlight the fact that when we talk about cultural safety it's also important to recognize that there are certain practices that are harmful and that intersection between what is culturally safe, but actually on the other side of it, there's a harmful practice, which we shouldn't kind of conflate with trying to be culturally sensitive and instead putting a woman or a person at risk because we are afraid to step into that space because we're afraid that we'll be culturally insensitive. I think as healthcare practitioners, certainly we have a responsibility to walk that tightrope while being culturally sensitive and safe, but also making sure that we address issues that are unsafe. And for me, it's domestic violence that comes to my mind within communities where that is an issue, but we might kind of skirt around it because we are worried about the cultural sensitivity side of it. So I just want to make sure that we realize that as well. Fantastic, very valid point. Thank you, Nisha, and it's really, really important uh, particularly when we talk about uh, violence, uh, domestic violence and violence against women and their children. Um, Sharif. Um, just quickly uh, around the cultural safety and Izzy's mentioned it, Nisha said it great. And PK has also talked about calling it out and calling out racism, but understanding and dismantling that cultural safety, there's a big component of that is understanding whiteness and white privilege. And also knowing that those terms are not harmful or damaging. We need to we need to be truthful about those term that terminology, and knowing that the actual actions perpetrated by people that don't have an understanding of their own privileges is actually literally killing my people. Like, so the issues that you have with being asked to confront your own white privilege is actually very minimal compared to the ongoing death, abuse, suicide of people that are un, that are you know suffering from racism and injustice from healthcare. So just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention as well. Very valid point. Language matters and, and don't be a snowflake, basically. Um, really, you need to recognise that actually there's impacts on people's lives. And I think that is such an important point. Thank you so much for raising that, Therese. Uh, I'm going to pose a final question. I know we're, we're just getting to the final uh, minutes of this, but hopefully people please do uh, stay on board. We are recording this, so we'll be able, if you can't uh, stay, you, there will be a recording sent around. But well, I'd like to spend uh, time with every panelist on this final question to our panel and any closing remarks you have as well. In the spirit of World Health Day's theme, which is hashtag health for all, what are some of the tangible actions that individuals, healthcare providers, organizations, uh, anybody really, maybe governments, can take to promote health equity and anti-racism in the sexual and reproductive health sector? Um, I'm going to start with uh, Nisha, if I can start with you. Thanks, Jamal. I'm going to talk about the individual. And I think from my point of view, if we treat individuals as individuals, we are more likely to be on the right track. I think a very key question to ask is what matters to you? Because first of all, with intersection, we put people into boxes and you know we put people into the box of you're from the subcontinent hence these are your risk factors and these are the sorts of things you will want that 
that doesn't speak to each individual person from the subcontinent because we are all individuals. And I think that is really key to what we do, asking that question, what matters to you, and then providing the healthcare based on what matters to that individual in front of us. And that is going to be different for the 20 people we see through the day as individual healthcare practitioners. So for me, that is the key. Beautiful. I love that. A really simple question. What matters to you? Thank you very much, Nisha. Uh, Izzy, come on, go to you next. Um, I think that we need to acknowledge, and I've completely lost the name of the theory, but there is a theory that the people who need care the most are the least likely to receive it. Um, and I think the doctors are nodding. You probably know the name. I've just gone completely blank and I can't remember the name of the theory, but, um, you know, it's as it, it was developed along, you know, some decades ago, but the Lancet points out it's just as um, relevant today. So I'm going to say that I think what needs to happen is that people from some of the diverse demographics that I just mentioned previously need to be centred in decision making um, and um, and that uh, you know, trickle down doesn't work. It's going to trickle up. So we need to put them at the middle and start listening for Christ's sake, start listening, please. We don't listen very well. Um, so, and you know, you can start with some of these people on this panel because the, the, the level of dialogue is quite phenomenal and I'm learning so much. So, yeah. Thank you. Listen, listen, listen. It's so, so important. And I guess attend these panels and, and other events and, and follow everyone here. Uh, everyone's on Instagram, everyone's on Twitter, everyone's on LinkedIn. So uh, I learn so much from all of you every day online as well. Um, Vijay, I'm with you. Mine's brief, which is just to say that I think we can talk to those in privilege and those in the dominant culture and all that sort of the bad guys we can actually talk to, including us, is we can say it in what a fantastic opportunity you have and how much you've got to give. So, in fact, we can use power in a positive way. I have power. I have the power to smile at someone and it makes their day a better day. I have the power to be kind to my patient and it helps with their health. I have the power to care about um, diverse communities or others who don't have the privilege that I have. So, in fact, Look at it that way. Look at how actually you who sit there with the privileges that you have, we're not putting you down. We're actually saying, we acknowledge it. We recognise that you have all these qualities. Bring them to the table and, you know, you will actually make a contribution that benefits not only the people who need it, but actually yourself as well. I love that. And it comes in that theme of the positivity and bringing it from a strength-based approach as you've been sharing, BJ, thank you so much. Uh, Rossi. Thanks, Jamal. Yeah, so to build on the responses so far and with my um, research advocacy and policy hat on, I would say definitely to advocate for truly universal healthcare and for access to everyone, regardless of visa status, regardless of geography, where, where you are in this country, regardless of race, because we know that even if in theory, um, First Nations people are meant to be treated, treated equ equitably, they're not. Um, and, you know, just to kind of um, look at what, and, oh, so if you're in a position where you provide healthcare and you cannot ask if someone has a Medicare card and you can waive their fees, please do that. Um, that's something that, you know, you can do if, if, if you're able to. And I, I know like some services who, who do do that. Um, and also at the level of advocacy, like we've been talking about how to um, improve cultural safety by, um, you know, enabling um, collective and social care, um, for instance, with, with grandparents and families. So, again, I think removing visa restrictions, like making family re re reunion visas and permanent visas more accessible and having a, shifting our policy focus that way enables people to then um, like, you know, really nurture those those models of collective care. Thank you. Such an important part of the equation, isn't it? And recognising that actually uh, the whole unit, the whole self, uh, as we spoke about earlier, it's not just about the health practice. There's a community, a societal and economic uh, and a whole different interface that actually affects everyone's health care and, and produces 
better outcomes for all of us as a community in the end as well, which we don't really reflect on and use. Thank you so much for raising that. I'm going to end with you, Cherise, before I do any closing remarks so, uh, for you to have the final word. Um, yeah, just as an individual or as a service, as an organisation, just challenging the institutions that um, that systemic discrimination and those actions and policies that are coming through and, and talking to government and lobbying and, um, you know, learning your own, your own self, your own knowledge, looking at your own values, but also learning this country's history and knowing how, you know, this will have been facing over the last five values and what do I hold strong in my culture, knowing that every single individual person that you come across also has their own set of cultures and their own set of knowledges and beliefs. Um, your engagement with one person in one moment, which might be 10 to 15 minutes, depending on where you work and just how systems flow. And, you know, we're on this constant time, you know, constraint that we have to just push through and we have to get through. It's actually, you might only meet that person one time, but any interaction you've had with them, that stays with them for a lifetime, especially when it's around sensitive topics relating to their body. So that's like miscarriage and birth and, you know, anything to do with them being a, having the ability to have children or their own health care. That um, experience will stay with them, positive or negative. They will remember you. And that's happened to me multiple times and that people actually remember. I remember that you were kind to me. I remember that you brought me a glass of water. I remember that you asked me how I was feeling. Um, and just basically just want to just like end it by saying like cool shit out basically at every level, every level in, in your organisation, in, in your system that you're working in. If you're, if you're a cleaner, if you're a person who manages the food, if you're someone who's a, a CEO or, a, you know, a first line manager, it's calling shit out. It's backing up those allies, those First Nations people and people of colour. They're the ones that are doing the brunt of the work. It's actually backing them up and actually standing behind them and saying, no, actually, we want to agree and we work with you. We want to work with you. We agree with you. We want to push through and support you to make these to make these changes. Because like I said in the beginning, it's not our job to dismantle that racism. It's the responsibility of everyone. So just making sure that you can hold true to what your values are. Values are. And like everyone said, at the end of the day, we're all human. We all have lives. We all are committed to making a change. It's just knowing that in that moment, the priority might be this, but also remembering that this person also has their own set of beliefs and you, you must, you know, show a bit of accountability to them as a health professional or someone who's looking after them and a bit of responsibility on your own self. And, and what can I do in this moment to make things that little bit more better or make this person walk away with a positive experience? Um, and like I said, it's your job to be the one to dismantle. It's your job to be the one to be the advocate for anti-racism. I'm not going to do all of the work. Nisha's not doing all the work like we're, we're just tired we're sick of doing the work so if you can do a little bit of work that would be great thank you really strong and powerful there you're so right and we have to always keep saying that it's not up to uh, people with the lived experiences to do the work it's actually everyone has to get involved educate themselves and drive the change Thank you so much, everybody, for your involvement in this panel. I really appreciate it, particularly as my last forum at MSI. Uh, it is something that is really close to my heart. And uh, I guess I would just wanted to share maybe, and I, I'm going to just reflect on those words uh, that you've shared, but I want to share maybe one uh, anecdote or something that someone can do as a CEO, one of the things that I've done at MSI, and this is really practical for CEOs and executives to do, is to positively uh, discriminate by recognizing that we need to have diversity, we need to have lived experience in all our leadership roles uh, and making sure that we do things like discrimination uh, reviews, we that bring it to the fore. I did an anti-discrimination um, uh, work that we did here, which recognized that racism was the biggest issue for us as an organization, like every other organization in Australia, surprise, surprise. Um, and we did so much work around ensuring that we had a diverse workforce. Uh, during that time uh, and making sure that women of color in particular for our organizations have leadership roles that there's lived experiences across the gamut within our leadership to support that and uh, that has made a huge difference and I'll culminate it with um, the difference really came to me when one of the executive members stopped one day and said to the executive and shared it with the rest of the organization I recognize that I've been racist I recognize that I've been racist and I need to do better. And we shared that story with the whole organization and to me, and it gives me goosebumps still. That's when you know you've come through because people recognize that actually it's not about being defensive, it's about being active 
it's taking it from a strength-based approach as VJ and everyone has said that as well. And uh, I've, that's one of my proudest moments, I think, in this organization. With what you've all shared, we need to recognize that cultural safety and anti-racism in health doesn't happen in isolation. We have to tackle the whole system. We need to center First Nations people first when we talk about everything to do with anti-racism. We need to recognize we've got over 60,000 years of culture. Um, what matters to the person, and I love that question, Nisha, what matters to you? Make sure you ask that question. It's about that individualized care and the holistic care. It's about making sure you listen, listen, listen. Uh, it's about those in privileged positions, you all have the power to make a change, to make a contribution that benefits our community, to benefit that person. And we should all be advocating for universal health access. And I love that example, Rossi. Wave those fees if you can, just don't ask. Wave those fees, make sure you support people. There are people, it makes a huge difference. And it's like those interactions matter. Uh, and as Izzy said, maybe not for us, but for that person involved. And Sharice, I wanna close with what you said call shit out so i love that let's call shit out let's be powerful back the allies and stand next to them and behind them thank you so much for everyone for joining us thank you so much to uh, everybody who's uh, here today sharice nisha rossi vj and izzy uh, make sure to go out and check out izzy's book and uh, please follow everyone on instagram twitter and wherever they may be online um, have a great afternoon thanks everybody <laughs>